Hi, good morning. Um, this is the read aloud for chapter two. Um, if you have not listened to chapter one and completed the first week's assignments, you should go back and do that now, okay? Um, so what we had been doing so far is when I'm reading, I'm going to highlight the things that are kind of weird to me. Um, for chapter one, I noticed that it began with a time, and I'm noticing that again, that it has a time. So what I'm thinking actually is that these times must be like everything that happens to the four characters that I'm reading about. I feel like it must happen during a two minute period of time right here. I think that the first section told us between 10.01 and 10.02, that was just one minute. And that what we're reading in this section happened from 10.02 to 10.04. So I think that whatever I'm about to read about Tomas happens in about two minutes. And then this in the same two minutes, this is what's happening to Sild in a different part of the school. Um, I think it's interesting. I think it's important to pay attention to that time because the author is purposefully putting it there at the beginning of chapters. All right, as I go through, I'm just going to go ahead and highlight things that I think are weird, uh, just like I did before. And that is all I'm going to be looking for. Chapter 2, 10.02 uh, to 10.04 a.m., Tomas. I reach for the bowl on top of the desk and pop a few mints into my mouth. Bar peeks around the principal's door. When he gives the all clear, I open the filing cabinet yet again. I haven't lost much work, just time. I noticed something that I actually want to point out right now. Um, the verbs here, these are present tense. So I reach for the bowl and pop a few pills in my mouth or mints in my mouth. I peek around the door. He gives me the all clear. I get back to work. He is telling you what's happening to him at this very moment. And I think that that also helps prove that this is a time frame of two minutes. It's, it makes it feel very, very immediate. So, all right, moving on right here. Principal Trenton may live in the pre-digital era, but she's like a cyborg. She always speaks until 10 sharp, leaving five minutes for announcements before the bell. By the end of the assembly, everyone has to run to make it to class on time for a third period. Well, in theory. The teachers and other personnel are in the auditorium too, and they don't run. So everyone pushes to leave, then strolls, dawdles, sneaks out for a smoke and some air. The two aren't mutually exclusive, thank you very much. After all, even nicotine and tar smell better than what my sister once described as our odoratorium, a unique blend of testosterone, sweat, and burned coffee. But we're cutting it far too close. I hate paperwork. Maybe you should stay on the farm then, Fareed draws. Honest work and hard labor don't require brains. You're hilarious. My fingers skim his file, and I pull it out of the drawer. Do you want to see the letter of recommendation Mr. O'Brien wrote for your college applications? He holds out his hands, and I toss him the file. A few sheets flutter from the folder before Far catches it. Barbarian. I snort. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. I look so young and innocent in this picture. Fareed muses is staring at the cover sheet. For most of our class, the pictures used by administration is three years old, taken when we enrolled as freshmen. In his hate case, however, that was taken last year. How you've corrupted me. Without your brilliant idea ideas, I'd have been a straight A student. Never in trouble with the law. Girls following me everywhere. Sure. I pull another folder out of the filing cabinet. Keep telling yourself that. Fareed makes another comment, but I'm not paying attention. A familiar picture stares at me from the cover sheet. Bingo. Brown, comma, Tyler. Gelled blonde hair, pale eyes, and an oh-so-familiar blank look. The one time his eyes weren't glossed over with contempt was when I slammed his head into a locker. My fingers itch to do it again. Does the administration note criminal charges in student records? 
Probably not when the files are this easy to access. Definitely not when said student dropped out at the end of last year. Besides, I don't know if he has a criminal record. According to his grades, he was a perfectly respectable C student. Three years at Opportunity and Tyler coasted through all of his classes. He only spectacularly failed Humanity 101. The latest note in his file is unmistakable, though. Re-enrolling, effective immediately. Sylvia mentioned it this weekend. It was the first time she'd confided in me in months. She looked ready to puke her guts out. She was so scared, but she refused to tell me why. So here I am, breaking into school records. To make sure she's safe, twin brother privileges. Not that I'll ever admit that or even hint that I care. Twin brother reputation. I lean against the principal's desk and read. Date of birth, address, boring. Emergency contact information for father, mother deceased, last school, date of admission, nothing I don't already know. Present class, not applicable. Not yet. SAT score, 2140. Huh. Closet genius. Maybe that explains why, despite his bravado, Tyler never made good on any of his threats. He may be a maggot but he's the smartest kind, a harmless one. I think this is kind of strange. He's a closet genius. I'm gonna, I wanna highlight all of it, actually. 2140 is a really high score on your SAT. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. Um, but why did he fail Humanity 101? Why is he failing this class? And why is he only getting C's in all of his classes? I'm interested as to why he he's clearly smart enough to do much better in his classes, so I'm wondering why he has not put forth the effort that he needs to. Maybe that's a teacher in me, but I find it weird, so I highlighted it. Okay, autumn. My back aches. I roll my shoulders to loosen the knotted muscles. Sylve lingers. Instead of rejoining the rest of her class, she cracks her knuckles with sharp snaps. Are you okay? I. I hesitate. I woke up drenched in sweat last night, expecting a knock at the door like two years ago. But this morning was breakfast as usual. Ty was nowhere to be found. And after this weekend, I didn't mind. Figure, his dad didn't get up. I'm wondering, all right, just before I go on, Ty was nowhere to be found. And after this weekend, I didn't mind, but she doesn't explain what happened this weekend. So that's weird. I want to know what happened. I want to know why she doesn't mind that her brother's not up, which I don't know. They probably just had some kind of fight, but it was important enough for the author to mention. So I'm going to go ahead and keep an eye on it and try and pay attention to why they did that. Okay. Figures. Dad didn't bother to get up. He started or never stopped drinking last night. These days, he doesn't even try to hide it. When mom was still alive, he only drank when she was away, and only during the darkest times. He still knew how to smile then, and he could make both Ty and me laugh. Now he's angry at the entire world, at anything that reminds him of mom, at me. I don't know how to put that into words. I'm not okay. I haven't been okay in a long time. It isn't just mom's death. Dad? Sometimes I'm afraid. And Ty? I'm afraid I'll lose Ty, too. But Sylv and Ty hate each other. How can I begin to make her understand? She places her hand on my arm, then remembers where we are and nervously tucks a long black curl behind her ears. I don't... Why would... Okay. I think that this is weird. She places a hand on my arm and remembers where we are. And then she did that, you know, thing where you, you put your hair behind your ears so that you're avoiding what you were doing. Why is she trying to hide putting her hand on this girl's arm? So it makes me think that maybe, um, I'm wondering maybe if they're having a relationship that's more than just friends. Um, but I'm not sure I'm gonna mark it as something that's a little weird that I wanna think about later. Her bright blue top matches her eyeliner, which makes her eyes sparkle. 
at opportunity where so many of us prefer to stay hidden she's the brightest spotlight on the darkest stage she looks at me expectantly it's understandable you know anniversaries can be difficult you can be sad no one will judge you least of all me i nod but the words still won't form the voices ebb and flow around us as students climb the raked aisles between the four blocks of seating Sylph's eyes flick to the other side of the auditorium where some of the football players are getting loud i shrug it's fine i'm fine she'd never understand no one does i'm counting down the minutes to seventh period when the music room behind the stage is dark and deserted in the shadows i'll be alone i'll be safe Sylve opens her mouth, but before she can say anything, a girl from her class appears at her elbow. Asha, I think. She used to get into arguments with my brother before he dropped out. I can't, I don't want to keep up with all of them. They will only bind me to this place, and it hurts so much to care. Asha clings to her AP US history textbook. Under strands of rainbow-colored hair, her mouth quirks up in a half-smile. She whispered something. Sylve ten tenses before she laughs, her voice rising above the crowd. Contrary to popular opinion, I'm not looking forward to midterms. Asha rolls her eyes. You have nothing to worry about. Sylve blushes. At a but Asha's right. Sylph's a straight-A student. The teachers adore her. She couldn't flunk an exam if she tried. Asha turns to me, and that's my cue. I plaster on a fake smile. Midterms aren't until next week, and I had better things to do than study over break. Philistine. Sylph sighs. How do I put up with you? Because I'm yours. The buttons on Asha's bag clink against each other. She flicks a purple lock of hair out of her face. No stress? Lucky you. I'm going to go ahead and highlight this. I think it goes a little bit more to prove that maybe they're in a relationship. But either way, it's a weird thing there. So I'm going to save that as a note for later. Lucky me. Before I can say anything, Sylv beats me to it. So what did you do? Nothing. Around us, the drone of voices becomes louder, more agitated. The first few moments after Trenton's speech are always a mess, with everyone tumbling over each other, trying to get out. But this is far more chaotic than usual. A teacher pushes through, probably to see what the holdup is. Asha grins. A hull of break? Absolutely nothing? Come on, spill. Sylvia's eyes are soft and questioning, and I nibble on my lip. I don't want to let her down. I found an old video recording of my mother's first Swan Lake in the attic this weekend. It was her audition for the Royal Ballet. She wasn't much older than me. It's not salacious news, so I expect Asha to be disappointed, but she leans in closer. Was it good? This surprises a smile out of me. Opportunity High is a county high school with students from all over the small surrounding towns. Asha isn't one of us. She is an opportunity where everyone knows everything about mom and me. She isn't part of our home turf of familiar street names, churches, and shared secrets. In opportunity, everyone knows mom danced around the world at every great company. London, Moscow, New York. She saw more countries than all of us combined. She told me about her travels and made me restless. For how much that memory of hers hurts, Watching her dance never does. She was amazing. Sylph's shoulder touches mine. Her warm smile anchors me, as if it's as if all of opportunity falls away. We're lost between making a home and escaping one. It won't be long before our secrets choke us, before she finally realizes I don't deserve her, and she leaves me too. All right, so they said a few things about secrets here, which I am interested in, which I think is kind of weird, All right? It won't be long before our secrets choke us and she leaves me too. All right, that's it.
for this uh, listen. <laughs>